Canada has a self-image problem, and many of the stories Canadians tell about themselves are wrong. That's according to one of our most well-known philosophers and writers, John Ralston Saul. It's all laid out in his latest book, A Fair Country, Telling Truths About Canada. John Ralston Saul joins me now. Good afternoon, Mr. Saul. Afternoon. What's wrong with the way Canadians see themselves? Well, I'm not so sure that it's that wrong in, in Whitehorse, probably, but uh, from my experiences there. But I think that, in general, Canadians are stuck on a way of talking about themselves, which is pretty European-derived and uh, sort of imported stuff, and uh, a language which doesn't really work for what the country really is or how the country really functions. And I think it's become more and more difficult to talk about the country. You're seeing a bit of that in this election, that there's no language seems to interest Canadians as coming out of these people and it's because they're not really talking about Canada they're they're using a language which would be appropriate maybe somewhere in Europe or in the States but it's not it's not doesn't really seem to be about about here and I think that's because we you know as a country wiped a lot of our uh, earlier language and our earlier experiences out of the way in the late 19th century and uh, and I, I, what I'm really saying in, in, in this book is that, you know, the first 250 years of Canada's history, and of course it depends on where you are in the country, where the dates work and so on. When the Europeans arrived, they really, for a very long time, were not simply dependent for details on Aboriginals. They actually were learning how to live in this place in a kind of metaphysical way, in an ideas way, in a social way. And so when you look today at you know, why are we a country of negotiation and not of violence? Or why do we believe that individuals and groups can live together in a kind of interesting tension? Um, why do we have a single-tier health care? You know, you sort of go through and you look for the roots of it. And the, the roots you find are not in Europe or the United States. The roots are here and they're back in that history, in that, that history of the experience of uh, example of uh, Aboriginals. Well, in fact, you describe Canada as a Métis civilization. What do you mean by that? Well, small m, you know. I mean, after all, there's a, there's a real legal thing, which is the Métis people, but small m, Métis, it, in the sense that I, I think we've always been about uh, a mixture. It's not simply started, as people say, in places like Toronto, with, you know, in the 1970s, suddenly we became a multicultural country. That's a complete misinterpretation of what happened. I mean, really... For uh, uh, from the very beginning, uh, when the Europeans came, they saw the way in which different uh, First Nations lived, uh, worked with each other, and uh, uh, and then the Métis and the Inuit, uh, and they they saw there was a method which was much more much less racially based and much more open to the idea of family, of changing the nature of family, of circles changing, mutating. And uh, so using the word Métis as a way, it's the opposite of the European or the American idea of the great monolithic, you know, English race or the, you know, the French or the all American, are you an American or aren't you an American, that kind of clarity, which was really never the way we worked here. Why is it, do you think, that uh, we're not more aware of, of that specific heritage? Well, I think it was, you know, basically from approximately 1850 on, it was, it was really written out of our history. I mean, as you know, the diseases did such damage to the uh, Aboriginal populations, what, dropping from about, what, 2 million to less than 200,000 in very few number of years, uh, breakdown of all sorts of f uh, hunting and food systems, uh, and then arrival of masses of immigrants from Europe who were driven by the kind of the British Empire idea and, and so on. And, and so I think that this false idea was put on the surface. But my view is, when I really looked at this, and I've been looking at this and talking to people for about a decade about it, uh, I think underneath it all, what allowed us to keep functioning was that at some collective unconscious level, we still wanted to function in the way we really, the way we really are. Uh, but, you know, the language isn't there. And the result is that we're not able to deal with our problems or our situations in an open way because we're always talking about it in the wrong way. And I, I, mean, I think there are lots of... I mean, look at all this stuff over sovereignty in the Arctic today. I mean, it's most of the language that's being used is straight out of, you know, about 1870. Now, you also take issue in this book with the slogan, Peace, Order, and Good Government. What do you think it should be? Well, it's not what I think it should be. It's what it, what it is. I mean, peace, order, and good government was stuck on uh, halfway through the negotiations of the British North America Act. And it was done really because 
uh, we were getting control. We were going to pay for our own defense, and that's what the order meant. That was what it was there to indicate was that 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 kind of order uh, was our responsibility. I mean, think about the phrase. It doesn't make any sense at all, right? If you've got peace and you've got good government, you got order, right? You right, right. Right. So it doesn't make any sense. It's and it's used. It was later on interpreted by kind of uh, th these pro empire people to mean that Canada was this boring little colonial place that. Uh, uh, which wasn't exciting and irresponsible like the United States or like France. It was this orderly place. Whereas in, that wasn't the intent when the word was used. But actually the phrase that was used again and again and again in all our constitutions and all our important documents from 1759 on was peace, welfare, and good government, which is to say well-being, uh, fare you well, you know, inclusiveness, egalitarianism. Again, quite close to the aboriginal idea of how a society uh, should function. Now, in the book, you say that Canada has a dysfunctional I elite. Why do you say that? Well, I think that, that elites have to know that they're the, understand themselves, that they're the elite. And, you know, you're elected in, you're elected out. You know, our elites aren't aristocracies. They come and go. But they're in charge. And, but they have to have the sense of what is this country what does this country want? What does this country need? Why does this country want things? When you hear people saying, for example, oh, Medicare, that's just a program. I mean, that's got nothing to do with, you know, the, the essence of Canada. That shows you they don't actually understand the country because, of course, programs are put in place as illustrations, applications of the way in which citizens see themselves. They're not just programs. The, the practical way in which we see themselves. If you don't believe that, then you're left over with cheap patriotism, where you know you say, where it's a lot of kind of songs and uh, you know hot words. Right. Uh, populism, real patriotism is being able to identify who you are and then putting in place programs that. Uh, th that reflect that, and when you have problems, you solve the problems so you can be like that. And I mean, I'll go back to the I'll go back to this question of the of of, of sovereignty in the Arctic. I mean, I know you're in Whitehorse, not in, not up on the uh, on the coast, but still, uh, you know, you listen to the language. It's all about these guys in the south who are going to send things up, send people up. You know, they're going to protect the north. It sounds like s sort of an empire sending sending troops off to you know protect the the margins of the empire. And it's based on a European idea, accepting a European idea of, um, uh, of, of water as something that separates land. This sort of, you know, the, the law of the sea is all based on an old Dutch idea that, you know, you own land, but you shoot cannonballs over water. And the law of the sea is you can control water as far as you can shoot a cannonball. So it started out about 300 yards, you know, rough around two, 300 miles now. And so it's the idea that water is sort of the enemy or the territory or the possible territory of the enemy, completely misunderstanding the nature of Canada, where even in the south, rivers and lakes were means of communication, highways. But in the Arctic, as you know, um, if you ask Inuit or, or, or Denny, they'll say, no, no, you know, water is what joins things together. You know, we go on the ice in the winter to move around. We go on the water in the summer to move around. There isn't a separation between land and water. They join together. So here we are making an argument before international courts, essentially, in the international community, based on a European idea. This is how dysfunctional our elites are. A European idea of water as a separation between land, which is to our disadvantage, right? It works to the advantage of the people who would want those waters to be, quote, unquote, international. When in fact, and, and, and we're basing that on the idea that we get our sovereignty because there were these English explorers who came and claimed it, and then the British got it, and then we got it from the British. So because idiots like Franklin, really, who didn't know where they were and you know, didn't know how to dress and didn't know what to eat, in spite of the fact that they were told by Dene and Métis and Inuit what to eat and just ignored it, uh, th these sort of idiots who were dr uh, passing through, uh, they, they are the source of our legitimacy, our ownership of the North, as opposed to saying, wait a minute, you know, it's the Canadians who live in the Arctic who are the source of our legitimacy. And, you know, a lot of them have been there for thousands of years. And their idea of water and land is that they join together. And so we're actually going to take a northern idea of the relationship between water and land to the international courts and say, we refuse to allow you to apply some European idea to the Arctic. Now, that would be a very interesting approach to take. And it would be a, a functioning elite that would do that. Well, you, you've referred to 
um, you know, the nature of patriotism um, in this discussion. Is that why it's important for Canadians to know the truths you talk about in order to make a greater connection to true patriotism? Well, I mean, maybe I shouldn't have used the word because it's a sort of difficult word. But, you know, you can't function as a country if you can't talk about yourself in an intelligent way. I mean, I'll give you another northern, northern example. Canada is the only circumpolar country that has no university in the Arctic. We have three colleges. One of them's in Whitehorse. Why don't we have a university? Why don't we? And they say, oh, well, we're waiting for the population to grow. Nobody else in the, in the circumpolar world is waiting for the population to grow. They've all got universities. Why don't we? Why don't you know? Why is our elite incapable of saying, if we really believe that we're a northern country, we ought to have, say, for example, a university of the north with three campuses, you know, in the three capitals of the north, and then you know the the Ottawa could put three or four uh, research chairs in each one of the cities that are specialized in northern issues, and then you know this would be a real poll for northerners, whatever their our origins to stay in the north and to build their careers in the north and it would draw other people up to the north it would make the north the center that it should be now that would be thinking like a functioning elite instead of a kind of elite that thinks it's running some other kind of place so it's important to know these truths because because if you don't know them you can't function as a real country mr saul thanks so much for talking with us today thank you very much john ralston saul is the author of a fair country telling truths about canada you can find out more about his book at his website, John Ralston Saul, all one word, dot com.